one of their sons named Ian was dying. Uh, the doctors had given them the famous 30 days left to live routine. Uh, told them to get the child's affairs in order. It had, he was around three, it had over 20 operations. I was on antibiotics 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and his body was falling apart. And they wanted me to do a memorial portrait because they couldn't bear the thought of buying uh, a tombstone for him. We talked, I said yes. Uh, <clears throat> he was too sick for them to drive him up here for a photo session. They didn't want me to go down to Tennessee because they felt like it would really upset him. <clears throat> so I conducted a, a photo session by telephone. And out of that photo session, I got one great picture of Ian where he had a tremendous amount of joy in his uh, sick little body and it showed up on his face. It was beautiful. And uh, I had my model hold little Van, my son. And I put those two together and created a painting. Um, I yelled. <laughs> I was like, ah! Anyway, I love it because... Um, it was full of light uh, to me. And when I looked at this painting, I just kept seeing the light coming off the Lord holding Ian. And it was just full of light to me, and that was so encouraging because often when people looked at our circumstances, they see difficulty, and I think that that kind of correlates to being too dark or something. And what I was excited about is that I felt like um, Stephen captured the light of what's in our circumstances and not just the difficulty. And so I've talked to parents who've, whose children have died and it brings them profound comfort. It's very humbling then to be a part of that process. I think the thing that um, impacts me about the work of Stephen's work, and I really think it's a reflection of Stephen and Cindy's work, is that um, there's a healing that's imparted through the paintings. And I don't understand that, you know, it's not a kind of a Western thought that we embrace, but I see it, I see the results of it, that people are able to, that the somehow the Lord, through someone kind of meditating on the painting, um, really receives a divine healing. Steve, Jesus loves everybody, don't care who you are. Um, he's everybody's friend. And uh, Steve's Jesus loves everybody. That's it. Well, it's God's Jesus. Yeah, I know what you mean. In a few of his paintings, I have actually made people cry in a good way. A lady who had lost two children, you know, and she broke down and cried, and Steve sold her the painting over the back fence for much cheaper than he sold it to anybody else. Or did you give it to her? <laughs> Probably gave I it to her. Gave it to her. She was crying a lot, wasn't she? I've seen so many people cry. I mean, I've um, whenever we go to um, conferences, sometimes I'll see people that come around, and I'm not talking about you know the the people that just see you know us. They're like, what what are those fools up to? They actually look at the art and. And see what you know. Try to read into it, and and actually you know open up their heart because some people scoff at us. I've I've had my feelings hurt. I've been in extreme defense for Steve before because um, of people just not giving it a chance. You know that's horrible. He said this. He said this, but he also said this. You know, but when people get touched, you know I've I've seen people come around. You know they buy art. Um, I go around the table and hug them when I'm when I, they see you know something and start crying. And the one in particular that I remember was of a, a I'm sorry I can't remember the names so of all of them. The ones with the little Chinese girl. Yeah, Forbidden City. Forbidden City. Uh, and a lady was up there that had a daughter that they had adopted, and uh, she said you know she'd never seen a picture of Jesus holding the. A little Chinese girl so I mean that just you know like oh you know I mean it, it talked to her it was it was who she was it was who Jesus was for her I think Steve Sawyer 
he is he's a minister that um, can can paint what he feels so that people can also hear it and see it. We had a couple of opportunities and circumstances where we had enough money not only to open uh, but knew we'd have enough cash to sustain us for a couple of years because you always lose money the first year. I, I We made twice as much the second year as the first which is always a fun lead in when I tell people that but that just shows how little we made the first year, you know. At the end of our third year, uh, we have grown a lot and and uh, kind of managed our finances as artists instead of accountants and strict businessmen and and uh, we just believe so much in what we're doing. We believe so much in the response we get from the people that appreciate the work that we just kept moving forward, um, turning a blind business eye, believing. Uh, that would survive it, and we just kind of got overwhelmed. Uh, uh, I was going to just turn my back on everything because I'm kind of bullheaded like that, um, burning bridges after me. And Cindy, um, you know, she always leaves some kind of a bridge. You know, you, you might burn down 99% of it, but there's always something you can cross back in. I found a couple of things I could remove, and one being is the apartment. Because, you know, where we are right now, art for God's right below us, so didn't want to lose the apartment. I don't like letting go of things that are useful, but we didn't stay here that much this year, so I, I hate losing it. It's my love shack. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, we're going to keep Art for God downstairs and, and keep that going, get into our fourth year. But it was a hard year. A lot of businesses here in Gatlinburg closed, a lot of businesses. I mean, they've got it down to the science about how you're supposed to start the car and buckle yourself in at the exact same time because it saves time. You're supposed to scan packages while you walk. I mean, they've got this thing down. And as you're driving, you have to be thinking all the time, how am I going to get this thing unloaded the fastest way possible? Where am I going to go first? Where am I going to go second? The day before yesterday, I had 116 stops, not counting pickups. So it's like 130 places I had to stop in one day. I found it interesting. There were 14 people in his class, all of them younger. And because um, it's it's grueling, we have a huge respect for UPS and FedEx because it is grueling, physically grueling. And um, 14 people for this huge area of Kentucky, many many counties, and every one of them quit. But Steve, I can believe it. Precious little hands have been beaten. My fingers are all split and dried out. It's been frantic because the phone, I don't know what's going on, but the phone has been ringing off the hook and we have two different lines. And so one will ring and then the other one will ring and then you'll have one phone here and one phone here and then they'll start flashing that another call's coming in. Well, this is the first watch I've had in probably 25 years. And you know, we bought the watch because you know, punctuality is just like freakish. Uh, you've got packages that have to be delivered by 10.30. You have packages that have to be delivered by 12. You have to start pickups at 2.45. I lost some weight, too. Can you tell? My turkey neck's gone down. Yeah, he's lost some weight. I mean, I don't know how much, but it's... That reminds me. That part's good. I kind of like that. Normally, his energy would come and leave, you know, directly through Art for God. He'd get worn out through Art for God or, and then would put his energy into Art for God. But now it's 
to UPS. It's more strange not to have or to have them come home so late and be 